The road to the White House starts in the Hawkeye State, and candidates continue to ask for your support to help them win the Democratic nomination for president. This is First in the Nation, an Iowa caucus special. I'm anchor Christopher King with political reporters Caroline Cummings and Nick Weig. On Monday, Iowans will be first in the nation to weigh in on the race for the White House. On caucus night, we'll find out who Democrats in Iowa want to lead the country and get a better understanding of who the top contenders are to challenge President Trump in November. Throughout this 30-minute caucus special, we'll tell you what the Iowa caucuses are, how they work, and introduce you to the many candidates, as well as where they stand on the important issues. Whether this will be your first caucus or the first time you'll be paying attention to the results, there is a lot to digest about exactly how all this will work. First, let's start with the Republicans, because this will be easy. Republicans will write down the name of the candidate they support on a piece of paper. A statewide majority wins all the delegates. Easy enough, right? But all the attention will be on the Democratic side, a wide open race with polls showing several candidates with a shot at being declared the winner. And the process is far more complex. So let's begin with exactly how they vote. The first step of voting comes when everyone makes their choice by voting or by walking to a certain spot in the room at their caucus. This is what's known as the first alignment. But at each precinct, a candidate like candidate number four here who doesn't get 15% of the vote will be labeled not viable. That means at that individual location, those supporting the non-viable candidate must choose another or decide to remain uncommitted. This second count will be known as the final alignment. Now this count will determine how many state delegates and ultimately national delegates each candidate will get. The most diverse and crowded field of Democrats running for president has narrowed, but the top contenders have emerged in recent months. Let's take a quick look at who they are and what they stand for. 28 Democrats threw their hats in the ring to become their party's nominee. Now 12 remain. But not all candidates are equal, at least when it comes to their support. Donald Trump, I believe, is incapable of celebrating what makes America great. Former Vice President Joe Biden entered this race arguably with the most name recognition and has consistently topped national polls. His message? This election is the battle for the soul of America, and he's the best candidate to take on Trump by unifying the party, but also bringing in independents and maybe even some Republicans. He said that he wants to build on what he and Barack Obama began in their eight years in office, like supporting adding a public option to the Affordable Care Act, the administration's signature accomplishment. But in Iowa, it's a tight race between Biden, Senator Bernie Sanders, Senator Elizabeth Warren, and Pete Buttigieg. We're going to guarantee health care to all Americans as a human right, not a privilege. Senator Sanders of Vermont is a self-described Democratic Socialist who has a loyal base that's mostly stuck by him since his run for president in 2016. He says his campaign is fueling a political revolution with a single-payer universal Medicare for All plan as a cornerstone of his agenda. He decries billionaires and corporate greed and advocates for other progressive policies like canceling student loan debt and making public colleges and universities tuition-free. He, like others, calls climate change the existential threat to society and has a sweeping Green New Deal plan. We want to fix that. It's going to take big structural change. You up for that? Senator Elizabeth Warren and Sanders occupy much of the same progressive lane. Warren of Massachusetts has her own Medicare for All plan and also supports tuition-free public college and erasing student debt. She pays for college debt relief and proposals like universal child care and pre-K and more federal money to public schools by her signature two-cent wealth tax or a 2% annual tax on net worths greater than $50 million. To do it together and turn the page before it's too late. Former South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg began a startling climb this summer, an unexpected rise to the top tier of candidates despite never having won a statewide election. A Harvard graduate, Rhodes Scholar, and military veteran Buttigieg on the campaign trail touts his industrial Midwest roots. At 38 years old, he says he represents a new generation of leadership. His health care policy is dubbed Medicare for all who want it, and he supports making public college tuition free for some Americans, and same with loan forgiveness. And you know my track record. You know how I've won every race, every place, every time. 
While Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar trails the top four, she believes her pragmatic approach and Midwestern roots could put her over the edge on caucus night. On the campaign trail, she often leans into her record in Congress and the U.S. Senate moving an onslaught of bills with bipartisan support. And she always touts her history of winning elections in Minnesota in both red and blue towns and counties. The rest of the Democrats in this race are polling in the low single digits. They'd need to pick up some serious steam in the time before caucus night arrives in order to remain viable. The Democratic polls seem to shift constantly. One day Biden leads, the next day it's Warren or Buttigieg. But the big polling story in recent weeks, Bernie Sanders. He is surging in early voting states, and that is making the Democratic establishment nervous. I am here to win in Iowa. And win Bernie the Sanders is vaulting ahead in recent polls. <laughs> the Vermont senator leads in many of the most recent surveys in early voting states. Sanders is ahead by six points in California, seven points in New Hampshire, and nine right here in Iowa. And he's a formidable fundraiser, pulling in more than $96 million since launching his bid last February. But the success of the self-described Democratic Socialist rattles some nerves in the Democratic establishment. They fear they'd struggle to beat President Trump if Sanders is their nominee. And they fret his platform of Medicare for All could hurt their chances in down-ticket races. Former Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel has warned Sanders' proposal may not play well among swing voters in battleground states. But so far, the polls are not reflecting that. The real clear politics average of polls shows nearly 52 percent of Americans disapprove of the job the president is doing. And real clear politics indicates, at least right now, the president trailing Sanders, Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren in national polls and in the battleground states, Pennsylvania, Ohio and Michigan. But President Trump holds the lead over those top tier Democrats right here in Iowa. So how did Iowa become so important on the presidential calendar? Well, you can thank a once long shot candidate in 1976 that used Iowa's small population to get a victory, propelling him all the way to the White House. It might be hard to believe now, but former Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter was barely mentioned in the 1976 race for president until his team got an idea by practically living in Iowa for months and focusing on the first in the nation contest like no candidate had before. God bless all of you. Thank you. And it worked. The barely known candidate earned more delegates from Iowa than anyone else and earned national attention that he took all the way to the White House. The office of President of the United States. Four years later, now President Carter returned to Iowa hoping to hold off a challenge from Senator Ted Kennedy. Let's be on our way. Thank you very much. He did and held on to the party's nomination. I don't know what the differences might be because I don't know what Mr. Carter's policies are. Before losing the White House in 1980 to Ronald Reagan. And will to the best of my ability. Reagan actually lost the 1980 caucus to George H.W. Bush, but still won the nomination. That started a long streak of winners who did not go on to win the party's nomination. In fact, the next nominee who started their bid for the White House with an Iowa caucus win, George W. Bush and Al Gore both in 2000. Since then, not a single Republican challenger has won the Iowa caucuses and the party's nomination. But for the Democrats, it's much more important because the Iowa caucuses have picked the party's nominee the last six times, including in 2008, when they handed a long-shot senator from Illinois a victory over Hillary Clinton, the first crucial step that put Barack Obama in the White House. New rules governing the 2020 Democratic caucuses in Iowa will mark a big change to the system. For the first time ever, the party will release raw vote totals. I asked a caucus expert to explain. Nobody had a raw vote count of how many Iowans had voted for each of the candidates. You only saw that 
you know, Hillary Clinton won so many delegates from this precinct and Bernie Sanders won so many delegates and Martin O'Malley won so many delegates. In previous years, those precinct level delegate counts were computed by the Iowa Democratic Party to determine state delegate equivalents. Whoever got the most of those state delegate equivalents won the caucuses. Hillary Clinton in 2016 barely edged out Senator Bernie Sanders 49.9 percent to 49.6 percent, which sparked some of the changes we'll see in 2020. That, those were a result of how close the election was, but also concerns and complaints by Bernie Sanders supporters that the Democratic Party had not established a nomination process that was free and fair and transparent and inclusive. That changes in 2020. The Democratic Party will release raw vote totals and delegate equivalents, and those raw vote totals will be for the first alignment or the first tally of preference groups to determine candidate viability and the final alignment or final vote. That final count is used for state delegate equivalents that determines who wins the caucuses. But the new system could potentially fuel campaign spin. These changes that have gone into effect will absolutely create new narratives by the campaigns to try to claim, if not total victory, a better than expected finish in Iowa in a way that we haven't seen before. Another big change from previous years, if your candidate or an uncommitted group in the room is viable in the first round, you are locked in and you can't support another candidate in the second round. You've met the candidates, learned the history, and know the key changes coming to the Iowa caucuses. Coming up next, a conversation with Democratic County leaders in Iowa about the issues. Welcome back. We are joined now by Ed Cranston and Janice Weiner, who are at the helm of the Johnson County Democrats. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Thank you very much for having us. We want to discuss a little bit about what is on top of mind for, for voters. You are at the helm of a party of the, the county that is reliably Democratic. Uh, can you explain to viewers what you're hearing from, from voters in your county? Well, I would say climate crisis is critical. I mean, it's, uh, it's very evident that we do have a crisis uh, with the flooding, wildfires, hurricanes, raising temperatures. Uh, it's a major issue. Iowa City has been somewhat at the center of that, at least in, the, in this part of Iowa. We have some high school students who've been very active in that, who got the city to declare a climate crisis, who got the school board to declare a climate crisis. We had Greta Thunberg here as well. So it is really the, the, the younger folks that I know really are looking to hear what a candidate has to say about climate crisis because it's their future. And Iowa City is the home of the University of Iowa where obviously it's a college town. There's college right, students true. there. Um, are you hearing about student loan debt, college tuition? I know that this has come to the fold among, among Democratic candidates. Yeah, I think you probably hit the top three. Climate crisis, tuition, as well as just, uh, well, probably health care in there as well would be another major issue for students. And because we not only have the university, we have Kirkwood Community College, branch of that down there, and that has become a, also a real focal point, not necessarily of campaigns, but when students are looking for ways to reduce their debt or get, mm -hmm. get the first couple of years done. So the way people are looking at education and the types of education they want to get whether they want to have vocational education or they believe, is it, do I really need a college education? Overall, it seems like priority number one for Democrats is, is be beating President Trump and, and picking the right candidate to do that. Can you talk a little bit about that being this, this very pivotal thing for, that, that Iowa Democrats are weighing right now? It's an enormous responsibility. It, and it's a privilege as well to, to be able to Meet, see the candidates in person, meet them, talk to them, not once, but two or three times. And I know people who are still torn, people who were supporting one candidate and now are saying, well, maybe we should support someone else because we want to make sure that, that we pick the right candidate to go up against President Trump. It's, Have uh, you seen this kind of urgency before in terms of beating an incumbent? Well, I would say that there's always been a case for electability. You always want to get your candidate to win. So, you know, that's always been the case. But I'd say this year it is, you know, magnified because of 
uh, the situation we have with, with uh, the president. Well, thank you, Ed and Janice. This was a great conversation and we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Iowa's different. Iowa's first in the nation. Still ahead on First in the Nation, an Iowa caucus special. President Trump wants four more years in the Oval Office, but he won't just be handed a win on caucus night. Why the Republican Party is still holding a contest. The Democrats are getting the lion's share of the attention this campaign season, but there is another party running, the Republicans. They're holding their caucuses here in Iowa, even though several states cancel their nominating process. I speak with the chairman of the Iowa GOP. I asked Jeff Kaufman, why is Iowa still holding Republican caucuses when the president does not appear to have any serious challengers here in Iowa? At least nine states, all with one thing in common. They canceled their primaries and caucuses or blocked other GOP candidates from appearing on their ballots. I was different. At least five states bypassing the nomination process altogether, throwing their support completely behind President Trump. Minnesota and Wisconsin among the states to give their delegates to the president without a contest. I think they're seeing that these poll numbers are real. Iowa Republicans stand behind Donald Trump. Nearly 90% of the party approves of the president. Several states say holding primaries and caucuses would be a waste of time and money. I respectfully disagree. Jeff Kaufman chairs the Iowa GOP and as a staunch supporter of the president. Iowa's first in the nation. Kaufman yeah, says it's vital Iowa maintain its status as the first state to make their selection for the presidential nominee. We can't skip and, and, and allow eight years to pass between a caucus and then depend on, uh, depend on that experience that would then be eight years old to make our case. We need to show the world that every four years, Iowa's the best place to start. Why is it important that Iowa's first? Kaufman says Iowa can jumpstart a presidential campaign. Two words, Barack Obama. They're, I mean, that, that's the first and the last evidence, but it's not just Barack Obama, Iowa made him. And I may not have been a fan of Barack Obama being the Republican chair, but you know what? I'm proud that Iowa gave, gave him a boost and we broke through a ceiling. Winning the Hawkeye State can give instant name recognition to lesser known candidates with less money. It's got to start in a place like Iowa where the media markets are reasonable, where you can visit all 99 counties. If we start in California, that's the 17th largest entity in the world. We knock out almost everyone that isn't a multimillionaire and a billionaire. Critics are blasting the other states for canceling their contests, saying President Trump is trying to stamp out competition. Not one time did I get any pressure to cancel our caucuses. Kaufman says holding the caucuses proves President Trump is willing to compete. I think it shows that we're not afraid to have Donald Trump come in here and open this up if somebody wants to vote for someone else. Monday is only the first step in a long journey that will end on election night, November 3rd. But what is the next step? We take a look at the most important dates moving forward. Iowa is the first state to kick off the nominating process. It can be a proving ground for a candidate who hopes to win their party's nomination. But there are several other states crucial in the primary and caucus season. Here's a look at what comes next. If you would please get your cards ready. The Iowa caucuses. And the temporary secretary is... They're the first test in deciding who will win their party's nomination for president. Our convention occurs at a moment of crisis for our nation. But there are several other early hurdles the candidates have to clear. Iowa is part of a four-state carve-out. So it's Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada. New Hampshire holds its primary on February 11th, a week after the Iowa caucuses. Like Iowa, it's a state with a relatively small population. And like Iowa, New Hampshire punches above its weight in political importance, giving anyone hoping to win the Oval Office a better chance to get up close and personal than in larger states. Nevada holds the next caucus on February 22nd. Latinos are nearly 28% of the 
the population there. The South Carolina primaries are on February 29th. African Americans comprise 27 percent of that state's population. Both groups play key roles in picking a winner. Then comes the second most important Tuesday in the nation's political process, Super Tuesday on March 3rd. It's often a make or break date. It's a test of how well a candidate can do across a broad spectrum of voters across large regions. 14 states hold their primaries, including heavyweights, California and Texas. Two states with large, diverse populations. Two states crucial in the November general elections. The rest of the states and territories hold their contest from March 8th through June 2nd. Now back to the Iowa caucuses. The Iowa Democratic Party expects record turnout Monday night. Now, Caroline, what kind of impact is that going to have? You're right, Chris. They are expecting record turnout. And I know the party is working diligently to try to accommodate that because, of course, uh, more crowds at a precinct. You can't make a precinct larger, the space larger than it is. So uh, I know one uh, mechanism they put in place was an early check-in option in hopes to kind of divert some of those crowds when they enter the precinct on caucus night. So that'll be something to look for. As for which candidate benefits from more, potentially more caucus goers, that remains to be seen. I know each campaign campaign in their own right has worked diligently to tap into parts of the electorate that otherwise wouldn't caucus, perhaps first time caucus goers, younger people, uh, minority populations. So I think that will definitely be a subplot, a plot line out of out of caucus night, which candidate got the biggest chunk of those first time caucus goers that t potentially fueled that record turnout. And Nick, in these crucial final days, the impeachment trial of President Trump really threw a monkey wrench into a lot of campaigns. Yeah, it, you could argue that no campaign actually planned on this. You have four senators who are campaigning for president, three in the running for delegates here in Iowa, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and Amy Klobuchar. We've seen Amy Klobuchar come back at night after the proceedings have ended and then fly overnight back to Washington. So she's still trying to do that that face-to-face -face meeting with the crucial votes that she needs. We've seen teleconferences, plenty of surrogates for the candidates. Now in the these last days, we've seen Bernie Sanders surge a little bit, Elizabeth Warren fall. Whether that has to do with their having to cancel events, we don't know, but we're just going to have to wait and find out on caucus. In any event, they're all going to have a very, very busy schedule. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you so much for watching First in the Nation, an Iowa caucus special. For Caroline Cummings and Nick Weig, I'm Christopher King.